Okay. I'm going to be begin the event now. So hope everyone's settled in. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, thanks for joining us today for the Efficiency for Access Design Challenge Career Conversations. My name's Sean. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Jackie Garcia and Luke Smith. Today is providing today is about providing guidance and advice um, to our student participants about the prospective careers in the sector. So I encourage you all to participate as much as possible in order to make the most out of this time with our industry experts. They've all very successfully started careers in the sector at one time or another. Here we go. So today, this is uh, today's agenda. Um, first, we'll be having a 20 minute period where our panelists will share their experience in the sector so far in an effort to provide you with true success stories. Um, I'll introduce you to them in the moment. We'll then follow this session with a Q&A period um, during which you can ask any of our panelists or experts about their experience and advice. This period, as opposed to the following breakout room session here, um, is an open plenary where you can ask all the experts with their diverse backgrounds about their experience. Um, you can opt to ask questions either over call or in the chat and either to the room as a whole or to a specific person. Um, panelists and industry partners, feel, please feel free to openly discuss these topics and back and forth is perfectly acceptable and encouraged. Um, then we have a breakout room session. Those of you who let us know your preferred area of interest, you'll be paired with one of our illustrious partners with expertise in that area. Um, those who will not will be randomly allocated. Um, sorry, further allocations can be taken at the time just to reduce the amount of manic things going on at the time. Um, so these conversations will run for 30 minutes um, and we encourage you to spend this time asking everything you can from these experts. They're structured to be more intimate conversations to allow for in-depth discussion about how you can personally achieve your goals. goals. Um, and then finally, a reporting back session will follow where we'll hear from each of you, each of you in each room, um, some key takeaways from those conversations and what you share is completely up to you. So before we proceed, there are a few housekeeping rules we'd like to lay out. The panel discussion portion of the event will be recorded. So if you do not wish to be recorded, please do not turn on your video during this time. Um, please everyone mute your mic when you're not speaking to avoid any background noise. And when you are speaking, if you're comfortable to do so, we encourage you to put on your camera. If you have not already done so, please put your name down um, underneath your video. You see those three dots on your video. If you click that, you can click rename. Um, that'll help us accurately allocate you to the breakout rooms and to help us get to know each other with what little time we have. I think most people have their names in from the registration. Um, finally, we hope all of you utilize this opportunity to garner as much as possible from the wealth of experience we have at this event today. Moving on to the event itself, we'll have the panel discussion. And um, I'd just like to introduce our panelists first. First, we'll hear from Frederick Amar uh, Amariati, a previous Efficiency for Access Design Challenge participant who last year was in the same position you are today. Um, he's, on, he's gone on to become a researcher with Strathmore University, where he studied and worked and studied and worked with GI and works with GIZ on implementing a global climate fund project promoting climate friendly cooking in Kenya and Senegal. His team last year pitched a solar powered container that could enable several services within rural settings. Their project titled Kijiji won a bronze award in the challenge last year. Um, then we'll hear from Nidhi Pant, co-founder of S4S Technologies, a near farm gate food processing platform that converts farm losses into value added products for the food and beverage industry by training landless women farmers to become micro entrepreneurs. Nidhi has been featured in Forbes 30 Under 30 Asia and was a Unilever Young Entrepreneur 2019 awardee among several other awards. Finally, Mohammed Sheryar, founder and managing director of Harness Energy. His company aims to provide reliable and afford affordable solar products, solar lanterns, home systems, and efficient appliances to low-income Pakistanis. Harness Energy works with multiple Verisol certified manufacturers and microfinance institutions to effectively deliver these products at the last mile. Sharia has an MA in economics from Duke University 
on the Fulbright Scholarship and is an Acumen Fellow. Apart from a passion for renewables, he is interested in cricket and astronomy. Um, so without further ado, please take it away, Frederick. Thanks, John. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, just to confirm again, can we all hear me clearly? <clears throat> yeah. All right, thanks. Thanks a lot. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, wherever you are on the globe. We hope you're doing well. I'm happy to be a part of this. I'm also happy to be here just to talk to someone here, you know, as you move on to the next phase of your life, ideally your career. And uh, I think the biggest thing is for me just to talk to someone about how I started my career, where I am probably share one or two lessons from where I've come from until where I am. And I hope someone will be happy at the end of the day. Uh, maybe a quick one, some bit about myself. Uh, I know Sean introduced me earlier, and like you mentioned, my name is Frederick Amariati. I currently am a researcher with Strathmore University in Kenya. I'm also working with GIZ on a, a clean cooking component, but more for a, a, a green climate fund project. We're promoting a friendly cooking in Kenya and Senegal. I hold varied training. I have both engineering, I have economics, so I'm a bit broad in this area and in this sector. Um, a brief on how I started. Uh, for everybody's information, I spent five years working in the oil and gas sector uh, in Kenya, and um, after which I moved on to undertake my master's in energy economics and policy from London. And I'm glad I did that uh, because it opened up new windows for me. When I finished my MSc, I had options of going back to the oil and gas sector, but uh, I think a couple of things happened. I learned of different programs or the initiatives that could end up leading the off-grid sector. And one of them was the Open Africa Power Program. It's a partnership between Enel Green Power and uh, a number of universities around Africa. Uh, and the aim of the program was to develop energy leaders for the continent, even as the continent seeks to move from more of a fossil dependent continent to a renewable dependent continent. And through all this, uh, a couple of things happened. And within this program, I think one of the things as participants is you are expected to go through some online course from Florence School of Regulation, and the course is called Regulations for Universal Energy Access which we all did, and I advise everyone else here to take some time and look at it. What it does is it introduces to the power sector, right from generation through distribution, and even to the regulations aspect of it. And this is where, and I would say, however new you are to the sector, this will be something you might want to consider uh, to look at and get involved in. I completed this course quite well and successfully. And again, I personally initiated Africa Challenge this was in Cape Town, where we came up with the Kijiji solution. But again, we went ahead to participate in the Efficient Access Design Challenge, which we won the bronze uh, medal for me. And this was brilliant. You know? This was great. And I would say, out of all these, I've had a chance to work with SMV in the Netherlands, but in Kenya. And um, currently working with GIZ, like I mentioned. And yeah, Sean, that's a small bit of my journey from. Um, how I started to where I am. And um, I would mention or tell everyone else some of the things, some of the things I've learned even through this journey is, and this will be the key lessons I wish someone takes away from here, that even as you grow through this sector, there's need for, you might want to consider getting a mentor. You might want someone to mentor you as you go. Like I mentioned earlier, I switched my career from oil and gas and um, was able to settle the off-grid sector thanks to different people who helped me. And I would mention some people like Professor Da Silva from Strathmore University through the Africa Power Program and later through Florence School of Regulations, which helped me also settle in quite well. And I also maybe to mention that there are lots of platforms out here that can support uh, the students, even as they settle into their careers. And I will still go back to the Open Africa Power Program with Efficiency for Access Design Challenge, which is the reason why we are here today. These are actually platforms that you need to grow some of the ideas you might have. Some of you will end up going into employment. Some will want to be set up their own farms, come up with their own ideas and grow them into projects and send it to the market. You might want to leverage some of these platforms to help you do some of the things you want to do. 
And then one key thing I will mention is I will advise everyone here be open to things like internships, field research programs. Uh, when I came back after my master's program, I had an internship on uh, some project targeting West Africa. Actually, it was the regional off grid electrification project for the off grid solar market. So we were trying to <coughs> assess the potential for solar market for West Africa and probably design a facility. This was funded by the World Bank. I got an internship opportunity on this, and I promise you this is what prepared me together with the skills acquired from province of regulation and a couple of programs I'd gone through. This really helped me understand the sector even more. And so I would advise everyone here, please take some time. If you see these internships, these programs, take some time to think through them and even be a part of them. One question that Sean asked us earlier at some point was, if you are, if I was to say something essential to anyone at this point in your career, uh, I would say this, if I was entering the job market, like most guys on this call, I would actually purpose to be a little bit more flexible. And I would say this because the off grid sector has lots of opportunities um, beyond the traditional engineering. You know, most of us imagine that the off grid sector is more of an engineering only field. But I would like to let all of us know is there's a social aspect to this field, there's an economics aspect to this field, there's an environmental aspect to this field that requires each one of us to venture in. And not that the skills you have as an engineer should not limit you, you know, should be a starting point for you to build your career. Build on them for now and see what other things that come, come out, out of your career. Sean, I think that's uh, what I would say for now. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you. That was really great. Um, now we'll hear from Nidhi, Nidhi Pant. You can take it away now. Hello, everyone. Uh, really nice to uh, meet you all of you virtually. I know we cannot connect one on one, but uh, thanks for uh, joining in today and thanks Sean and team for giving this opportunity. I, uh, you all are really budding experts in, de in different parts of this uh, sector and working on different things. So my, I would definitely take you through my journey uh, first, just to give you some background. I studied chemical engineering uh, in Mumbai, uh, and it was during my college time that I co-founded S4S, which stands for Science for Society, which with its primary objective uh, of providing scientific solutions to rural areas. And now we have evolved. Uh, what we do is that uh, we solve the uh, three major challenges. The so one is the uh, food wastage and food losses that happen in the food agriculture and food supply chain. And uh, second is that the farmers don't get the right price for their produce. So this being two major focus that our organization is trying to solve. And we do this by a very important uh, decentralized solution, which is a solar dehydration, solar drying. So our solution is based, uh, we, uh, our organization has three major pillars. First is that everything has to be decentralized and should use renewable energy. Second is that we need to provide financing options for these uh, solutions to make it more viable for the end cons uh, consumer to use it. And third is to find market. Where is the money in the economy that uh, we as an entrepreneur should frame the model or through some way or the other like when we initially started we started by selling these dehydrators to the farmers but soon realized that that is not where the market potential right, uh, lies and uh, so we pivoted and now it's an end-to-end -end model where we deploy this technology and buy back the food we never envisaged that we would be a food uh, dehydration would convert into a decentralized food manufacturing company but uh, from selling equipment to actually selling the food from the equipment, we have traveled the entire journey because we realized that as more and more solutions, as technologists, uh, we were very glued to our solution. We were very 
uh, loved what we were doing and it was working really well. But at the same time, we also have to realize that there needs to be an economic uh, way in which we captured this. So who's going to pay for the food that's prevented in the entire supply chain? What would be the business model? So now what we do is that we set up these systems we buy the bag, the food from the system, which is now converted into non-perishable. And we have found like a big food and beverage, global food and beverage market that we serve. These food products, we serve as food ingredients to major packaged food uh, companies like Nestle, Indian Railways, uh, Sodexo, Unilever, a uh, couple of them, and also to small hotel restaurant catering industries. So some of the points that I would really like to highlight that were my learnings and I hope that you guys being enthusiastic in the sector could be a bit aware of is that uh, as technologists or as economists, you are really glued to one part of what you do. I would really urge you to explore, uh, widen, your, um, widen your thought process, widen your learnings. And also if you're a technologist, it's also good to have understanding of economics, uh, how will this work, have some understanding of how things work actually at the ground level and it is not only like a technical know-how. If you are a business model uh, or you are more inclined towards business, then please do uh, go back and see that what parts of the supply chain is important, where and how does it impact the customer. So, and the customer should be at the center of it. Uh, if you are as much as the uh, purpose and uh, the objective is clear that we all are here uh, climate activists but at the same time we need to be very mindful that uh, we need to have patience for all of this to be executed it is not going to be like your digital economy it's, it's a real economy things are actually happening at the at the ground level so it's important to widen that horizon first and second is also to get a lot of on-ground experience. So I would urge you that apart from doing your uh, proper course curriculums, also spend some time on the ground to see what actually is happening and what solution actually works. We, when we're designing models, when we are designing the tech, we really think that, okay, this is this like on paper, I can, we, we can make everything work. We can make that uh, the efficiency is highest and we can do those modeling. But it's important to see and uh, what are the challenges at the ground level. We see multiples. Uh, elect we work with these women who are. Uh, there are a lot of socio-economical challenges that actually are around the business model. Where sometimes the technology is really great, but uh, your end user is not evolved yet to adapt adapt it. So you'll have to change it or model it based on what. Is, is the requirement of the, that. Sometimes we over-engineer the entire process. That's also not required. So as much as you would want to be very close, close to the customer, uh, look at other avenues in the entire, um, I'm, I'm saying more from a company building perspective, but not all have to be entrepreneurs, but whatever you are doing, even if you're doing some research, be open to other parallel avenues that, uh, sh that you should at least have some understanding of uh, in terms of feasibility. So uh, feasibility is, is important. Third thing that I would urge is to study what are the existing models that have worked. So paper who works really well, what are the other uh, new financing models that actually work with the technology uh, also in, in place whenever, if you are a textbook. But just evaluating some of these things that have already been done and how that can be leveraged for you to create some, not necessarily it is required that always you create something new. You could just change some part of it and uh, leverage whatever are the existing solutions. And because the end objective of the entire sector is to move everything forward collectively. So a lot of time there are so many solutions, different, different solutions. It's just important to also look at it from a very, uh, not very biased point of view, but uh, but be very open and adapting, adopting and collaborate as much as possible uh, in this sector and see why things have not worked in the past so that you can learn from, uh, from them and uh, not repeat the same kind of mistakes. 
third thing that i would really like to say is that there are so many platforms like um, efficient efficiency for uh, access uh, there are so many ecosystem builders uh, these days there are five to seven years uh, back some of these opportunities were a little uh, difficult to find but now all of this is uh, is present so starting from your internships collaboration research papers be very uh, open in adopting new uh, skill sets and work as much as possible from the ecosystem players as well, work with them as well because they give you a very holistic picture of the sector uh, as much and so there are three things work in the ground with the customers work with the ecosystem builders because they would give you a high level think about what's working what's not working so having some of those experiences is also really helpful and third definitely is to find to form your own perspective about what is this that you would like to change or you would like to contribute towards so be very vocal about that write blogs writing is i, I think a very you know underrated skill set uh, it's important for people to know what what is your take about everything that will help your career also to move forward so uh, find opportunities uh, where you can present your work this is a great platform uh, and is really structured really well and gives you so many resources gives you access to uh, both entrepreneurs real life challenges and uh, having that thesis in mind you have a very bright future now you can actually uh, take multiple routes you can be a vc in any fund like in any fund you can be uh, you can take a part of more uh, of researching or uh, like an analyst in say giz or usa and you can you have multiple career options but few foundational things need to be really same for everything is uh, what i would uh, say is that um initial initial part of your career it's important to have that hunger of learning so learn as much as you want from different avenues both from ground and also from uh, people who are evaluating case uh, and making 3d case studies so you get a 360 degree perspective and never uh, be shy of reaching out and bug people and tell them if you don't understand anything so be very shameless in asking and that's the most powerful thing um that i that i and i'm i'm sure like most of you know it but just to reiterate it uh, reiterate in the end that if you are not if you don't if you're not very shameless you're not learning uh so be open to be wrong or be open to uh be challenged and do the, have a proper peer to peer uh, session where you are challenged by others and learn in the process and learn by uh, from entrepreneurs from ecosystem builders from vcs from uh, these kind of challenges from internet everywhere so uh, be open for learning in a and adapt yourself as much as you can so this is what i would like to uh, like to say with say with all of you thank you nidhi thank you i'm sure many people will have lots of questions for you at the end <laughs> um and finally let's hear from sheryar thank you hi thanks sean uh, do you mind i might have to run the slides in the background while i'm talking so sure. yeah hi everyone this is sheryar from harness energy in pakistan uh, we uh, are sellers of uh, solar lanterns and solar home systems uh, in uh, rural areas primarily and uh, like sean pointed out we are sort of in the middle of the value chain uh, in between manufacturers and last mile uh, lenders we provide the products and we provide warranty after sale services and uh, you know stuff like that and i'm going to actually uh, give some generic advice that i have career wise and then move on to our story uh, at the end so uh, uh shawn do you mind i because sound can you can you share the screen if it's possible can you see the screen right now can you see them Yeah, got it. Okay, perfect. Okay. So and just tell me when you want me to change the slides. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, uh, it's not an easy thing uh, to enter the job market, uh, especially those of you who directly jump from your college degree to your master's degree and did not have any job experience in between, and especially uh, after last year, uh, getting into this tough job market is not an easy thing. 
Uh, but of course, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, good to get prepared early on. So I guess uh, the career choice you make, the kind of job you want, the kind of company you want to work in depends on a bunch of factors. There's no one thing. Uh, I mean, even for, let's like, say, the batch, uh, like your class batch that uh, you are with, so you might uh, have, uh, you know, 10 students in your class and you might be studying the same curriculum, you might want to go into the same industry, but then the uh, the sort of trajectory you're coming from, what you studied in childhood, the kind of family you have. So there's a bunch of factors, a lot of variables that do eventually decide where you go. And uh, so uh, your uh, your principles, your uh, what kind of values you have. Let's say for me, rural electrification was super important, and uh, I wanted to you know uh, put some of my time into that. And uh, you know, and, and, and all these factors, uh, these sort of uh, if I want to call it the multivariate regression of where you want to turn up in your career, will be different for everyone. And my advice on this is do not try to replicate anyone's career path, not at all. It's easy because uh, in this uh, day of uh, clickbait media, you always have these articles, you know, uh, how did Elon Musk become a billionaire? What kind of books this guy reads? And of course, it's nice to have a, a good sound advice, you know, learn from their habits and learn from their work ethic. But you cannot follow anyone's path uh, at all because you there's too many sort of uh, uh, how to call them degrees of freedom that are different for every single person so uh, the main thing is to make sure you have the work ethic you put in the effort and uh, of course as we will see uh, each one of you will have to decide which sort of industry you go in whether that is the long-term uh, sort of preference for you uh, so yeah and if we can move on to the next slide Sean uh, secondly, uh, there's an important consideration these days because uh, a lot of uh, uh, sort of uh, coverage is given to new startups and entrepreneurs, which is very good. Uh, new ideas, innovation should always be encouraged. But I would still say weigh your options very uh, pragmatically and rationally. Uh, you have to figure out whether uh, the, uh, whether you are more suited towards uh, working for someone, uh, working in a company, having a job or you know taking three to four years of risk in you know immediately when you graduate from uh, uh, college or university whether you want to start your own business and there are some factors over there that i observed uh, that are critical that could help you make a sort of a better decision uh, first if you are someone who prefers stable income then entrepreneurship is not the way to go because uh, i generally like to compare this stable income versus risky long term payoff in terms of a sort of like a farmer versus day wages uh, sort of uh, 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 comparison because a farmer when they're sowing their crop uh, they put in all the seeds fertilizer and everything but they sort of get their income after 4 to 5 months when the crop is harvested but a day laborer a construction worker they get paid off immediately on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. So you have to figure out what kind of personality you are. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't think a lot of you will be going to become farmers or uh, sort of construction workers, but sort of the personality mode, you have to figure out whether stable income is important for you or whether you're willing to take the risk. And then of course, uh, uh, going forward from this point, do you have the capacity or the conditions to take those risks? Let's say uh, in a lot of times, uh, especially in uh, developing countries or low income countries, people are living with their families. They have this uh, sort of burden of uh, contributing to the monthly sort of budget and all that. So if you don't have uh, the sort of financial capacity to take the risk, uh, because if you're sort of uh, making your own startup, founding your own company, you might not have any income you know for that matter for the next two three years so how will the rent where will the rent come from how will your sort of groceries and fuel uh, uh, come about and this is especially a big problem in uh, low-income countries because access to capital is really difficult uh, anyone uh, attending who's from east africa kenya uh, uh, india or pakistan you know that if you don't have collateral no commercial bank will lend to you no matter what kind of idea you have no matter if it's you know the craziest idea in the world so access to capital is very important. And in these uh, uh, sort of in this situation, if you're from a family where your friends and family or, you know, let's say your father or uncle has a parent company who can put in that sort of uh, angel equity investment, that is one of the things that could, uh, you know, uh, help you de decide whether you want to, you know, do your own business. Uh, this is the idea of work-life balance. Uh, because one thing is for sure, I run my own company. There is no 
switch on off button when you're running your own business so when you go home even it's like 11:30 at night and you're playing with your kid and suddenly you're thinking about you know how to uh, you know send that product somewhere else in a better way so that is obviously a bit of a stress uh, so uh, and obviously when you're working for someone there is a certain amount of work life balance so i'm just warning you especially the guys out there uh, your uh, your beard hair will uh, get to start to get white earlier if you choose your own business or entrepreneur entrepreneurial life and of course generally speaking it depends on what kind of person you are if you are not a very risk taking person uh, in 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 general so i wouldn't suggest you know just jumping into the bandwagon of uh, entrepreneurship or you know uh, i have this new idea oh i got to work on it sometimes it's better to have a you know a rational thought out uh, sort of uh, pros and cons list and to see you know where you end up because i have a couple of friends who in my opinion if they had uh, worked for a company for the past 4 years they would have had some savings they were they would have been financially more stable and probably uh, uh, ahead in their career path but they chose to you know just go to this incubator this accelerator and they sort of i mean they didn't obviously they didn't waste their last 4 years but um, nothing substantial uh, you know no substantial product or uh, you know something big came out of that so be be sure to weigh all the options and next slide please john uh, so now coming to our story uh, harness energy started in 2016 uh, before that i did my masters in 2012 and i worked in the family business for about 4 years uh which was also focused on the rural economy but we uh, i started to uh, i sort of decided to spin this off into a separate company uh, uh so we started in 2016 and this is a picture of the solar lantern like a small product that we started with uh and we uh, signed agreements with the microfinance institutions because we were having a lot of trouble selling this product uh because we didn't really have that ground uh, reach so we figured that microfinance institutions would have that already uh, established network so it's it'll be sort of better to ride on their coattails first rather than develop your own sales force which takes a lot of uh, time and resources so over the past 4 years what we've done is we have gradually uh, like nidhi pointed out they pivoted you know their business model so we we figured out that uh, solar lanterns were just the stepping stone but ultimately in countries like pakistan the weather is super hot so fans are the real deal people really need fans uh, to sort of uh, uh, whenever they buy solar they need a fan either a ceiling fan or a stand fan so we pivoted 2 years ago into higher capacity solar home systems like 80 watt 100 watt 150 watt solar home systems that can run fans for you know uh, 15 to 18 hours a day uh, and we only do verasol certified products because that gives us peace of mind and uh, gradually in uh, the next 2 3 years we ended up signing exclusive agreements with uh, four uh, uh, sort of verasol manufacturers for the country for pakistan and we uh, one strategic decision that we took was we did not want to get into consumer financing because that's a different ball game altogether different business model we didn't want to get our money stuck over there and that to uh, uh, this decision was also uh, based on a lot of research we started a lot of companies in uh, east africa west africa who were uh, raising a lot of investment but they were not getting uh, returning any profit and we figured that that was mostly because they were trying to do the entire value chain so we 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 figured out that we didn't want to get into consumer financing we'll just give them the microfinance people a wholesale discount on our products because they're giving us access to their customers and their sort of uh, field uh, force and then we'll tell them to do the uh, uh, financing themselves so they will repay us back after you know every month or so so our cash flow cycle is really good and uh, last year we were shortlisted for the efficiency for access cooling call uh, we're developing pakistan's first uh, brushless motor uh, fan a basic fan and a rechargeable model uh, that will go with our solar home systems and as a standalone product and at the top uh, of this uh, right hand corner we have this i just gave you a snapshot of uh, there's this really big uh, synth government program uh, for the next 3 years financed by the world bank and there were a lot of applicants in that but uh, out of the 40 40 odd applicants we were one of the suppliers that were shortlisted so overall uh, uh, it's been a good journey a tough journey uh, uh, a very uh, memorable journey but uh, again i would like to reiterate having your own business uh, being an entrepreneur is not an easy job uh, but ultimately if you if you are sort of uh, putting your eggs in the in the long basket i know you have all must have heard a lot about long and short uh, trades over the past week or so so if you are going long and if you are willing to invest your time and money for the next 3 4 years you might have a, a good uh, return uh, a longer term payoff
So that's uh, pretty much all for me. Had to find the unmute button. Thank you, Shara. That was great. Um, so now we only have about 10 minutes for our Q&A portion. A um, little bit shortened, but we want to hear um, from everyone. So we encourage everyone to participate in this portion of the event. Um, and you can ask questions either through the chat or by um, or through your voice um, and either to the whole room or to individual speakers or experts. So and ask your questions. Go ahead. Yes. Hello. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question for Mr. Frederick. Yes. Uh, we want this. Yes, we would. Me and my fellow classmates. I'm from Makere. My name is Derek Yamachi. Good afternoon to you all. So, would like to know about the internships. Uh, yes, of course, we want these internships, and these internships always create opportunities, and opportunities come from the opportunities inside there. So, uh, you cited something about the World Bank and projects and those internships. But as a class and me personally, we are not so vast, well, well versed on these internships. I would like you to maybe advise us on how we could go or we could search on these internships, what we could target and key areas to focus on. Yeah, especially on these projects such as World Bank. As in Uganda here, we are mainly focused on these local manufacturing companies, Coca-Cola, Rufins, and all that. We never open our minds to these other opportunities outside East Africa. Yeah, maybe you could hit something on that. Thank you. All right, okay, thanks. And I will agree with you on some specific things that most students, when they are done with their, their masters or bachelors, always a starting point is uh, which factory or which company is nearby that I can easily walk into, you know, which makes sense. It made sense to me then when I just graduated. It makes a lot of sense because you want a place to start from, but which is not wrong, I would say that. The only thing uh, we're saying is you have a chance to listen to what we're saying now. And the opportunity is, do you want to check out and see? I would, let me go back to my example and say, when I finished my master's, I needed to switch the sector, and I did. And the opportunity I came up with was the World Bank project. They were doing a research, and good enough, uh, the, the consultant was best in Kenya. Uh, I'll tell you what I did. I don't know if you want to try it, but I honestly called the consultant and told him I want to be a part of this, even an internship basis. And I'm happy even if you don't pay me for that. I know that's a sacrifice most people not want to make easily enough. But again, for me, I knew once I'm done with this, uh, the, the skills I would get, the experience I would get, would really help me to move into other things. And that's how I got to learn. That's how I got to learn about the sector. And for information, um, the course I did from Fraud School of Regulations on the power sector reforms, it didn't make sense then until I got into the World Bank project, the internship. I realized all the things you're covering on the project were actually the clear things you are being taken through the course. So those are, that's a radical decision for you to make, asking something to do for free of charge. But again, I had to do that because I knew the value I was getting to that. And that was gladly accepted. But I would suggest this. There are a couple of projects happening in Uganda and you might want to check out on guys like SLD Uganda, JZ Uganda. They're doing some projects. And if you really want to be a part of it to learn, you might just want to call in and say, hey, I know this project is happening. Or would you like to, do you have internship opportunities? If they are there, some of them will gladly do that. And if it's OK with you, I could probably get some contacts just for internship if you're really happy to do that. But what I'm saying is, we, most students when graduating have huge expectations are walking to this place and get this job and get that and that, which never happens. The best thing is, and like I said earlier, be as flexible as possible. If you don't get that job you want to get from the first place, what are the opportunities there? There's an internship, go for it. Efficiency for access challenge is another very crucial thing. 
if this comes out, you guys have an idea as a team, why not participate in it? One thing I know is it's a good platform for you to get connected to other potential donors, some of the ideas you might have. Think about them. Open Africa Power Program is something that's really happening in Africa. You know? It's something you get to be taken through a skills training for a period of one or two weeks, get through some of very important online courses that promise you if you paid on your own, it's very expensive. But then once you're done with that, the linkages, the networks you make out of it become very crucial. So yes, I would say this, be flexible. Check out on some of the things that are happening with these organizations. How many times you go to World Bank website, you know what's happening with young people, the graduates and all that, walk into that, see what's happening. Every organization now is trying to get a, a platform for students to be engaged, whether on paid basis or internship basis. That would be how we should look at it. But if it's okay with you, I could just probably share a few contacts in Uganda and see what would happen if that stuff within the GIZ portfolio, they probably consider it. SNB will be the same. I can make call our friends and then tell yes. them, hey, so and so, look for this. If it's okay with you, that's fine. That, 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 that would be great. That would be great. Uh, for me, I would want to have that opportunity. Thanks, John. Hi, Sean. I have one question for Nidhi. Uh, so so uh, the, the idea we're working for on this year's Efficiency for Access Design Challenge is kind of similar to what you're doing. It's in the agriculture business. So uh, I, uh, since you said that you started out with a product that you sold to the farmers for uh, drying and then uh, midway somewhere along the line, you changed your business model. So my question is basically twofold. First is, uh, since uh, these these projects can be kind of capital intensive, so uh, how do you uh, convince these people for for whom an upfront first cost is more difficult and more daunting than rather running costs or operating expenses? And secondly, is it when you decided to change your business model, like what were the obstacles or like because I'm also thinking that if we go ahead with the first idea and let's say it doesn't pan out, then is there a way out or can we salvage this idea? So these are my questions. Hi, sorry, Dave. Hi, uh, congratulations for uh, doing this amazing challenge and working on this project. Looks really exciting. Uh, you have really thought through a lot. So uh, great work on that. My uh, two cents would be that first, if, it is, if your product or your service is something that is going to help farmer earn better or increase something that he's doing, which is directly that you can measure, there is a scope for which he can, he or she will pay. Like at, in our systems, it increases their income, like because there's a value addition that's happening, it gets converted to non-perishable and we can sell it at a higher price, like something that a dry onion sells at, uh, sorry, a fresh onion sells at 10 rupees per kg, a dry onion would sell at like 120 rupees per kg because there is a big value addition that, that's happening. You see it, this is still B2B, you can still see it in B2C that uh, it is 17x, 17 to 4 times uh, at a higher pricing. So first I would definitely urge you that for us, uh, market size was really important. So a lot of big farmers were the ones who were really uh, excited to buy our projects. They used to just have their own, um, they used to have like a centralized place where they used to put the dryers and get laborers to uh, work there. So they did see a lot of ink, uh, their own ways of using it. But we did see that our uh, potential or like the market that we are trying to address is not the large holder farmers. We decided to go with small holder farmers uh, for multiple reasons that okay, there is a recurring income actually that, that also flows in. They are the ones who actually need it. The value addition uh, is most relevant to a smallholder farmers because a wastage is also more happening at an, uh, is not happening, is more happening at a fragmented way. So it's solving more and more problem for the food. So what I would say is that, yes, it's capital intensive. There are various, uh, either you or the farmer has to put the money for, uh, the system to work so uh, the you can look at various financing options like right now we partner with the bank and the bank finances the machine and we uh, assure them an additional income so the deductible which is the 
EMI for the hardware is what uh, the the farmer pays us over a period of five years. So whenever we buy the food product, we deduct the EMI for the machine. So there are in this manner, neither are we putting the money, and neither are the farmers putting the money. But yes, at the prototype stage, that's difficult. So if you ask me, this is really at the scale up stage where everything is working. You know that you can lend like the farmers. Uh, or the bank can lend based on cash flow projections but in uh, to start with you will have to go either with an fpo you have to go at a more aggregated uh, level i am happy to put you in subject uh, work you uh, work through uh, some of these contracts but you will either have to go through an fpo model you have to have some uh, farmers who are more forward looking for them to try the product or sometimes just create uh -huh. i don't know about your product in detail so i cannot comment on that but um yes there are different ways it could be figured out if you just want to test it out second is that what are the uh, when you try to pivot what are the challenges one is that basic challenges that your skill set is very different so you're trying to move from a technology company to a financing plus a market linkage plus like x y z so the business model uh, is what you will have to safeguard in in different ways that okay uh, whether are you the right fit to do uh, all of it and uh, our approach definitely has been more market driven in terms of that uh, if we have a proper market in place so if there's a big enough market and then you are trying to really do something you can really see things moving there um, so the pivot the, the major learning was that there should be a big market and that's why food and beverage and that's not like that and that's why not anything else um we could have gone more nutraceuticals way we could have gone a bit more on um, more uh, specialty product way but we we uh, actually mapped the market and the the same way we decided which one to then enter and you can also do benchmarking globally uh, so that was one of the major learnings that market drives things so uh, for these solutions to be adopted you also need to be sustainable nash Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you, Sir Deep. Um, so we're coming to the close of our Q and A session, but we had two questions during during that period um, from Nguri Brian and Alec Wamu Moses. So um, if we can just keep those questions really short and the answers really short, we can go through those two, and then um, any other questions that you have, you can bring them up in the breakout rooms. So. Brian or Moses, did you want to? Mm, yes, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Guru Brian. I'm a mechanical engineering student from Macquarie University. And my question goes to Frederica. Uh, it's quite similar to the one Derek asked. And it goes, uh, OK, it's about how to access opportunities as, a, let's say, a research assistant uh, while you're still doing your undergraduate degree. Uh, so that, uh, especially with projects that are sort of related to the 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 innovations you're working with, uh, yeah. Uh, let me cut it there. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank, thanks. Again, I will still respond in a similar way to like I did before. I think one of the things, and I will point to this. One thing I've seen most employers I've worked with look out is when a student or someone is a student walks into the, into the office and says, I'm happy to be a part of your project under whichever arrangement while you're still a student, it's always moves most employers. I've seen that happen many times. And so I always say while, a, while you're still a student, it's very easy for you to get in some of these things because you can, we go in on support basis. And most of the time, the things that happen is once you're done, we will always consider someone has been with us for a while, you know. And so while you are there, it's always a good thing to start from. I think your question is, how do I identify these opportunities? And I will still say this. Are there any collaborations between your institution and other organizations within your area? So say, for example, JZ Kenya works closely with a number of universities in which uh, we, we support innovation in areas like cooking and renewable energy, whichever thing that comes up, we support some bit of innovation. Do we have such platforms? I think there's a question you might want to think through. Think through other platforms that could be there apart from just that, and then uh, see 
what will be the implication if I just walk in and say, guys, do you have something for a student? Most of them are more than willing to help you come in on a support tour. Okay. Thank you, Frederick. Um, Moses, just our last question, and if we can keep the, both the question and the answer very quick so we can move on to the breakout rooms. Okay, thank you, Sean. Uh, my question goes to the efficiency for access team. I've already sent a text to Jackie. So I wanted to inquire because me and my. Sorry, you cut out, Moses. Okay. My team are developing a maker space in Uganda, uh, which, which is going to have equipment, prototyping, and stuff like that. It's part of the other challenge of the efficiency for access. A university students taking part will have access to our space so that they can uh, develop their prototypes. Uh, we, we want to make sure we have at least 3D printers which can aid uh, our prototypes. So I would ask whether the efficiency for access team uh, would find it uh, helpful also to get in touch with us, see how best we can also uh, promote this uh, competition. Because you find that the competition is here in Uganda, but uh, students don't have space where they can idea their ideas from. The universities don't have resources, to be honest. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, yeah, we can we can keep in contact and and see what um, how we can support you with on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody, um, and thank you especially to our pa panelists. It was great, and it was great to hear from you and hear all your stories. Um, I know that some of you have to leave now. Um, but yes, it was great to hear some success stories from coming out of coming out of this industry. Um, so shortly we will be um, we have our thirty minute open discussion um, with our industry partners. Um, you'll be going into a room that you have indicated you want to be allocated to. Um, we don't have time to do full int introductions of our experts, um, but you have the opportunity to formally meet them once you're in the room. Um, so let me just go through them in the engineering rooms. We've, um, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your names. Um, I'm just, I'll, I'll give my best try right now. Um, so in the engineering rooms, we have Venkat Rajaraman from Signe Energy, Stuart Crane from Village Infrastructure Angels, Ulysses de Wagemacher from Solaris Offgrid, um, Audrey Kakpohu and Julian um, Patron from Naji B Group, um, and Kimani Kachuche. Um, from Medili Solar Hubs. Um, then in the management rooms, we have Richard Atwell from Renewit and Tushar Devidayal from Devidayal Solar Solutions. And in the science and research rooms, we have um, Omile Toyobo from Chai and Sri Vijay Gauda from Selco. So um, you'll be given a prompt in a, a, soon, um, giving you the option to enter a breakout room if you just click OK, then you'll be brought there and we'll bring you back in half an hour. Um, if you're struggling with what to talk about, we have some key discussion points for you to bring into the session for you to get things started. But it is just, um, it is, oh, sorry, Sri Vijay, you're in a management room. Um, so this will, this will be an opportunity for you to have an um, open discussion and you to you'd talk about anything you like. So I'll see you in half an hour.